Mitch Altman, take it away. Mitch gives a very inspiring presentation. I hope you will give him your full attention. So thank you, Mitch. Thank you, Jonathan. So hey, everyone. So um, this will, uh, in, a, in a way, sort of dovetail off of the last question I asked to Jonathan about if he has a day job. Um, <laughs> And uh, maybe that'll become clear in a bit. So, um, <laughs> how many people uh, do you think are unhappy with their work in our country? <laughs> so, I, I looked that up for this talk online, which is the fount of all knowledge. And uh, according to where I looked, it was 80% which is really a bummer if you consider that we spend about a third of our lives there. But uh, I turn TVs off for a living. My name is Mitch Altman and I love my job. <laughs> so by presenting my journey from a depressed blob of a kid to a jet-setting public speaking inventor who loves my life, I'm hoping that others may benefit from my experience because if I could do this, really anybody can. But I didn't start off happy. I grew up in my own little world, propelled there by being brutally bullied, targeted for being an introverted geek, fat, gay, bad at sports. Teachers and parents were no help. Generally, life was hell. So when I went home, I retreated into the magical world of television. Kids on TV, unlike me, were beautiful, had loving parents, understanding friends, problems that were solved by the end of the show. It was totally depressing. <laughs> so I just retreated more into myself, only to become more of a target, only to retreat more into TV once I got home. Can you say addiction? Sure. Yep, sure. I'm a TV addict. But there are so many ways of avoiding oneself, and I've tried most of them. Tonight I'm just going to talk mainly about a couple. Uh, TV is one and work is another. So, um, <laughs> that, one, that one comes next, uh, get ahead of myself. So since TV is such a huge part of my trip, I'm going to do a little bit of ranting here. Um, this is a, a sophisticated audience, so uh, my rap on media literacy is probably not so important as when I do talks like this in front of kids at school during TV turnoff week or whenever. But um, there are all sorts of things about TV um, that a lot of people don't think about because uh, it's just TV is ubiquitous, right? So fish and water. Um, but what do you think TV is for? Anyone care to guess? Yeah, well, uh, I think you all got the basic idea. So it's really about profit, but not just profit. It's maximum profit in the next quarter, which is what corporations are for, mandated by law to support the uh, shareholders. So there's nothing wrong with profit, but when it's maximum profit in the next quarter is the primary goal, there are consequences. TV is not there for my benefit, it's not there for your benefit, it's not there for our benefit, it's for maximum profits in the next quarter. And there are consequences to that. The biggest for me is that time goes away. So statistically speaking, the average American, if there is such a thing, but statistically speaking, the average American watches four and a half to six and a half hours of TV every day and lives 70 years. So if you take the smallest number of that, you know, and that's according to all these different studies, the smallest number, four and a half, multiply it out by 70 years, that's 13 years at the end of one's life doing nothing but spent watching television. So what if a magical fairy could come along on your deathbed after watching these 13 years of your life, watching TV, you're about to die, but the magical fairy says, I will give you back those 13 years to do whatever you like with. What would you choose to do? <laughs> if the answer is an enthusiastic watch television, then you have lived an incredibly fulfilling life. <laughs> if the answer is anything else but an enthusiastic watch television, then maybe you could have done just something a little bit different, just something a little bit cooler. There's always something, no matter where your life is, that you can do a little bit cooler. 
So why wait till your deathbed to make those choices? Why not make them now? So there are other aspects to television. Oh yeah, one little factoid also. Let's say you have your own favorite little half hour TV show and you're watching the reruns five days a week. Multiply that out and what do you get? A little bit of, of a little bit more than one year spent watching that favorite TV show. In my book, that TV show better be damn fucking good. <laughs> That's a year of your life. So anyways, maybe there's something cooler, maybe not. Maybe it is a really fucking cool show, but it's totally up to you. I don't want to tell anyone what to do and what not to do. I'm making provocative statements, hoping to provoke some thought. I think our country could use a little bit more thought. So, um... And I, I'm here to help. <laughs> so um, another aspect of television, people who, uh, you know, I, I've put a lot of thought and research into television, it being my big bugaboo. So uh, I just uh, reel off uh, a few of the things here. Um, you can look them up on, online or ask me more about it later if you like. But people who tend to watch more television tend to be less healthy. And it kind of makes sense, too, doesn't it? Because when you're watching TV, you're not doing something active, something healthy. You're just sitting there watching. And these messages repeating over and over again called commercials, the predominant ones being junk food, are repeating over and over again. And maybe it looks really good to eat some junk food while you're just sitting there doing nothing but watching. So uh, people who tend to watch more TV tend to gain more weight. And it's turning out that... Um, Next to high fructose corn syrup, the next uh, uh, reason for childhood obesity is television watching. So uh, what's next? Um, yeah, one thing, um, um, with, uh, one thing I learned from uh, developing, sort of uh, <laughs> bumbling my way into helping develop virtual reality back in the 1980s, um, we discovered that uh, brains, it's really easy to fool brains into thinking something's real. You don't have to show much, just sort of line drawings even do it. But all you have to do is give a, t a context and repeat something a few times and your brain says, real. So it seems to be one of the main functions of brain is to uh, do pattern recognition, repeat it a few times, and your brain says it's real. So with virtual reality, your intellect can be telling you, I am sitting in a chair looking at some computer screens in an office building in Redwood City. But the rest of your whole being, your psyche, is saying, uh-uh, I'm floating in a cloud, purple pigeons are flying by, and on that cloud over there is a folk singer singing bad music. So um, that's what's real. And the TV industry makes use of, of this, um, often quite explicitly, in the messages it repeats to try to sell us products. And um, through repetition, um, commercials do tend to work, statistically speaking. So um, one thing, one predominant way of uh, presenting uh, uh, an advertisement for selling product is to start off the commercial by somehow keying into our insecurities and saying, you are not adequate. And it does that usually by comparison because it has some beautiful people over here, impossibly beautiful people. Where do they get these people anyways? These impossibly beautiful people having the most incredible time of their life or maybe they're always having this incredible time because they're so damn beautiful and they're using product X. Now I know none of you are going to go out and buy product X just because you've seen a commercial like this, even if you've seen it a bunch of times. But statistically speaking, these commercials do work over a population, repeating this over and over again, more people buy product X. And they put a lot of time and effort and energy into uh, figuring out how best to do that. But the, what I want to point out here is the unintended consequence of a repeated message, which is, you are inadequate. How many times can any of us hear that message over and over again on such a powerful medium like television before it has at least some effect? Before we're feeling just a little bit um, inadequate, uh, alienated, disconnected. So, um, you know, there's a bunch more I can say about TV, but uh, the one thing is, uh, oh yeah, just one thing about lowest common denominator. Um, TV advertisers want to get as many people to watch their commercials as possible, to suck as many people in as possible. So, um, they're not going to say, 
you as a unique individual, this is for you, they're going to say, this is for the lowest common denominator for a, a bunch of people across, for a cross section of normative society. And as a result, we don't see ourselves reflected back from the commercials, and the content is there to grab us so that we'll watch uh, the commercials. So it's also working for lowest common denominator. As a result, we don't see ourselves reflected from the content as well as the content of the commercials. And sort of by absence here this time, how often can we have repeatedly these messages over and over again where we're absent from it before we're starting to feel a little absent? before we're feeling a little more disconnected and alienated. And uh, I did want to say one other thing, too. I've studied uh, brainwave uh, stuff a lot since undergrad. I did uh, physiologically of, uh, physiology of mind um, classes a lot. I was a guinea pig with having uh, you know, sensors all over my brain going into an electroencephalogram for brainwave research. And um, there's a spectrum of frequencies that a brain is constantly emitting. When you're awake, it's usually beta waves, and that's what we're doing when we're, when we're conscious. There's another set, a little bit lower frequencies from that, which is alpha waves. And then there's theta and delta, and there's even gamma. But alpha waves is what uh, I want to talk about here. There's one thing and only one thing in the history of two million years of people on the planet that induces alpha and only alpha waves in human beings, and that's television. Now, alpha is not bad. You need alpha in order to live, in order to drift to sleep, in order to wake up, in order to meditate, in order to groove on uh, solving a problem on one of your geeky projects, or just being a groove in general. Alpha is really important. But when we're just experiencing alpha, it's kind of trancy and kind of nice, but you're totally passive. What more perfect state to be in to absorb TV commercials? Now, this wasn't done purposely, but Advertisers do make use of this, which uh, is pretty interesting. Um, so all of this put together um, means that people who watch TV tend to be less happy than people who watch less TV. Um, did I say that right? People who watch more TV tend to be less happy than people who watch less TV. Um, and for the, that makes sense, doesn't it? Um, so uh, for the first time ever, a university study came out on November 14th from the University of Maryland, which finally proved just that. They came out, and the headline of the story was, people who watch more TV tend to be less happy. Um, and they even used the word addiction when talking about people who watch TV, because people who watch, um, like any addiction, people who are using say during the use that they are more happy, but soon thereafter and uh, several hours thereafter, they say that they're less happy. And um, so that's addiction, and that brings me to that one other slide. This is another way I've used to avoid myself, but like all other ways of avoiding oneself, there are pluses and there are minuses. <laughs> so I have to talk about pot here because it saved my life. Really, in my high school, all you had to do to be considered cool was to smoke pot. Suddenly, I actually enjoyed hanging out with other kids instead of just hanging out on my own, being afraid of being beaten up. It also led to my first popular invention, the electronic bong. <laughs> so, <laughs> but of course, uh, it being the way it is, I abused it. Avoiding uh, yourself through feeling trapped at work is another great way of uh, really avoiding oneself. So uh, I learned this from my workaholic dad, and I tried it out on myself in my first real job, which I hated. Uh, but I lived in this beautiful rent-controlled apartment, but in a city I didn't like at all. So, um, Boston. Choice is a really powerful thing. I was a TV-watching, uptight closet case, feeling trapped in a job in a city I didn't like at all. I made all of those choices, and I was miserable. It was time for new choices. I never liked TV, even as a little kid. I actually remember when I was five years old, precocious as I might have been, thinking, I don't like this, why am I doing this? But I didn't have an answer, I was only five years old, so I kept watching TV. So the thing is, as an adult, I came to the conclusion, I work eight hours, sleep eight hours, and watch TV with whatever little time is left, 
no. But what else to do? So I started by stopping doing what I knew I hated. So I quit my job, bought a VW van, and moved away from Boston. So I'm traveling where the only choices are which ways to turn at which moments. So why not choose which ways feel good? Well, one choice leads to another, to another, and I'm in Alaska at my first consulting gig. <laughs> Knee deep in fish heads, covered in slime, and ripping the guts out of fish, and loving it. And when I quit this job three weeks later, hating it, um, I realized that for the first time in my, ha in my life, I'd actually been happy. So I go down the West Coast. I inevitably, inevitably run into Silly Valley, I, I mean Silicon Valley where I can sling bits rather than slime for a living and make enough money in three months to not work the rest of the year, which is pretty cool. But um, after about a decade of doing this, I thought I wanted more than just a pretty cool life. So what would happen if I took a year off of work and only did what I loved? Scary thought, scary move, but I had to try it. So. I ended up doing a lot of volunteer work and this totally great geeky project. Which brings me to inventing, which is three steps. First, seeing a problem, like TVs popping up all over in public places. Then, coming up with a solution. How about a universal remote control that can turn them all off? Finally, implementation. And TV Be Gone exists in the world and people can finally have fun turning TVs off. <laughs> So I worked on TV Be Gone because I loved it. Several of my friends helped because they love it, making it all possible. But we never really thought we would make money from it. It was just a fantasy. Yet, on the first day of sales, $24,000. I was propelled instantly into the media spotlight. NPR, New York Times, People Effing Magazine. Uh, I was even on Fox TV News. I was asked to give public presentations, me, an introverted geek, yet somehow I did okay. And that's how this whole line of work that I am currently still in got started. Um, overall, I totally love it. There's so many cool aspects about building a business about something you really love. And if you are gonna start a business around a project, Make sure you damn well love it, because the parts that are uncool are incredibly uncool. And if you don't love it, you will hate it more than you've ever hated anything in your life, and you will not make it through. And I'm speaking from my own personal experience here, and perhaps I'm projecting on others, but uh, this is uh, my uh, advice learned by hard knocks. Um, there are times uh, throughout the TV Be Gone business that uh, were really unfun, um, even though overall, like I said, I really love it. Um, let me uh, just see here. There was uh, one thing I wanted to say. Did I say it? Um, yeah, so uh, just one thing. Um, even though I grew from this depressed blob of a kid to someone who really loves my life, all of those issues that I've always had in my life, none of them went away. All of them are still there. They're not necessarily as important th as they used to be, and maybe they've changed form, but like managing time. Before, I was really bad at it, and I sucked it all away watching TV. Well, I'm still not good at it, but the thing is now, there are just so many cool things to do. How do you choose what to do? And when you run a business, there's so many things to do. Like, I have all these projects going on at once. What takes priority at any given moment? Well, today I thought, gee, I've got all day I'll have enough time to put this presentation together. Well, I actually had a different presentation than this in mind. So this is somewhat recycled from the talk I gave at Noisebridge last Thursday. Um, but hopefully it's working out and good enough. Um, but the thing is, I get 100 emails a day. That's a lot of emails. If each one takes one to five minutes, that's a lot of minutes. But I have to answer them every day. Otherwise, the next day I have 200. And the next day I have 300. So anyways, I did that. And um, then I'm preparing for um, these two conferences coming up in San Jose is eTech 
And right after that is the UK Maker Faire in England. And for both of these, I'm going to do uh, workshops teaching people how to do um, cool things with microcontrollers and teaching people to solder, which I totally love. It's way fun. Um, and I also do that at, at Noisebridge uh, every Monday, if anyone's interested. And um, uh, also, Noisebridge uh, is this hackerspace that I started uh, with a bunch of people in San Francisco, uh, just at 16th and Mission. Check out noisebridge.net. It's totally cool. And I'm the treasurer, so I had to do accounting for Noisebridge today. And um, then another unfun part of doing business. I'm in a lawsuit with these people who are ex-customers in the UK who stole the TV Gone, copied it, and are passing it off as actual TV Gone using the TV Gone name. And the guy kept calling me today, and it's stressful. But um, you know, still, uh, even with all of that, it's still totally cool. It's what I want to be doing. Um, Here's th that's what's going on now uh, with the business. Let me tell you just a little story about uh, some interesting uh, problem that I had at the beginning of TV Be Gone business. Um, you know, like I said before, I wasn't thinking that TV Be Gone would make me any money because who would buy a thing that would turn TVs off in public places? I thought maybe in my fantasies it would uh, supplement some income from some other source. So when uh, I but I figured you know some people will buy it, so I'll put it on my website and I should have. Uh, credit cards. People want to use credit cards, so I'll let them use credit cards on my website. And one of the questions for the credit card processor was, how much money do you think you'll make annually? I'm like, well, I don't know. Uh, it doesn't really matter. There's no consequence to this question. So I'll fantasize and exaggerate it to $100,000. Well, like I said earlier, uh, the first day of sales, I made about a quarter of that. And after three weeks, I got a phone call from the credit card processor saying, we have a problem here. You said you'd make $100,000 annually, and it's uh, three weeks later, uh, and you've made three times that. I mean, is that a problem? So, well, yeah, it's not in your business plan, so we don't believe you can actually fulfill your orders. So we're not going to give you any of the money that people have been giving you. And actually, it turns out that's totally legal. Banks can do things like this. Yeah, unexpected uh, things that happen in business. So. Um, so they prophesied that uh, I will not be able to fulfill my orders, and it nearly came true because I couldn't fulfill the orders because I was sold out, and I needed the money from the orders in order to pay the manufacturer for the new TV Begones that I'd ordered that were going to come in to fulfill the orders. They weren't going to give me the money. So uh, fortunately, luckily for me, my mom and my two brothers kicked in the money to pay the manufacturer, and the, I could fulfill the orders not fulfilling the prophecy of the credit card company. And it took a year, but I finally got that money back, and I could pay my brothers and my mom back. So um, <laughs> <laughs> you never know how things will go. So expect the unexpected if you are in your own business. Um, yeah, and um, yeah, one other thing I wanted to say just about running a business. It, you know, suddenly. People are buying TV Begones like crazy. You know, it was just on Wired.com, and, and evidently people like pay attention to Wired.com. I, I, I never did, but uh, you know, that's why NPR called me and New York Times and blah, blah, blah. And um, so it got way out of hand, and uh, people are buying them like crazy, and they're $20 a piece. And if you're selling a lot of something at $20 a piece, a lot times $20 is a lot of dollars. So it should be really easy to make shitloads of money, and it is. However, keeping any of it isn't. <laughs> so I have to pay 11 other people besides myself, and after I pay all of them, I get what's left. And it turns out that that's just barely enough to live the life that I live. But as it turns out, that's totally cool because I get enough money to live the life I really love. So something wonderful happened for me from all of life's ups and downs. You know, bringing together all of these aspects of my life that I thought were wrong with me, you know, like TV addiction. But it really gave me an outlet for my own unique geeky self. And in conclusion, I just really want to ask all of you to please choose well what you do with the time of your life. Please do what you love and the world becomes a better place.
So if there's any questions, I can field those, or if anyone wants to do an open door. Or <laughs> Does the TV be gone turn off any CTVs yet? I, uh, I'm working now on generation four TV be gone, and I have the NEC code. I got the NEC code at a hacker conference in Berlin. Um, they happen to have, NEC makes these commercial TVs that are only available uh, industrially, not for consumers, so it's hard to get the code because they're not in universal remote controls, which is how I get all of my codes. But they had these ones at the, uh, the convention center, and I went up to the manager of the convention center and I told him, you know, just what the hell, I, I collect off codes for TVs. And I don't have this one. Can I borrow your remote control? <laughs> and he said, yes. <laughs> so I will have the NEC code uh, in the next generation of TV Be Gone. Remember how we work for an AV company? Yes. <laughs> we buy commercial TVs all the time. Well, I, I, we should talk. I'll <laughs> <laughs> shut you down. Oh, I, I'm perfectly happy. <laughs> Yeah, so I'm always looking for new codes, and uh, projector codes are also hard to get. Uh, yeah. Is Cornfield Electronics a reference to Twilight Zone? Cornfield Electronics, is it a reference to Twilight Zone? Um, you know, a bunch of people have asked me that, and um, oh, when I was a kid, I did watch TV every waking moment of my life, and uh, Twilight Zone was one of the few shows that I actually enjoyed. Uh, and the creepiest one is this one about a kid who sends people to the cornfield when they don't obey him. And it's, it's totally creepy and horrible and uh, great. It's really well done. Uh, I was not thinking of that when I came up with the name Cornfield Electronics. Uh, I was living in Urbana, Illinois, which is a huge school supposedly good for engineering. Uh, but in fact, it's really just good for collecting people who have high profile names in engineering. Um, like the person who invented transistor and things like that. But he's so old and senile, he couldn't teach anybody. Um, so uh, anyways, I did consulting there. And one day, I had to order parts the first time for a client. And the person on the phone said, what's your company name? And I didn't have one. So I looked out my window, and I called it Cornfield Electronics. <laughs> <coughs> Any other questions? Yeah. Yes, so I want you to speak about geek community and your experience at Noise Digital and you know, the importance of that. So uh, I was asked to uh, talk a bit about geek community. Um, so, wow, there's a lot I can say about uh, community and geek community in particular. Um, you know, as introverted geeks, um, you know, most geeks are introverted, not all of us, but uh, I certainly am, and most people I know are. We, uh, you know, have been reinforced to stay away from scary, emotional things with weird people and stuff like that, and we can go to our own little corner and do whatever geeky thing it is that we love doing, and people, um, uh, like parents and teachers, go, wow, that's... Uh, kind of cool, he's way focused, uh, let's give him kudos for that. And, um, so what's that? And riddling. And <laughs> riddling quite often, uh, you know, or some of us who happen to be Asperger's or something, even more bizarre drugs. But, um, but we all have some, this sort of as an overlap, and uh, we had to learn later in life how to interact with people, and all of us here have been able to do that to a certain extent, otherwise we wouldn't be able to handle this crowd. Um, so having some way for us to get together um, to share our experiences, because we grew up um, on this planet where human beings evolved over, you know, whether it's 200,000 or 2 million years, however you look at humans, it's in our DNA to um, survive through society, through being social, to cooperate with one another, to survive against nature, which is sometimes cool and sometimes kind of hostile. Um, so how do we deal with that in our modern planet, especially as introverted geeks? Um, well, there are so many ways that we um, hunger for community. And I think everyone in our modern culture starves for community in some way or another. And we are lucky enough to have things like DorkBot that some fabulous people have just said, hey, let's have a DorkBot. <laughs> and, uh, you know, and look what happens as a result, just one person's idea. And um, hacker spaces have been popping up all over the world and they're starting to proliferate like crazy just over the last year or two um, as a result of uh, really the, a lot of work that's been done over the last quarter century in Germany um, due to, um, um, you know, just a handful of people uh, collecting all sorts of geeks to do cool projects. 
And um, there's also hacker conferences happening. We can get imme immensely recharged by sharing our projects, by learning from other people's projects, and, um, you know, and then go off into our own little geeky corner and do cool stuff, come back and share it. And um, So I don't know, there's just some random, random brain firings for me on that thought. <laughs> yeah? What other horrible things should we look out for if, if we go into business ourselves? What other horrible things should you look out for if you go into business for yourself? Oh, wow. Uh, you know, we should do that over dinner sometime. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's, there's just so much that can go wrong. And the thing is, you have to count on, you have to take risks. You, and that's scary. To take a risk is really scary. But if you don't take a risk, if you don't make room to do what you love in your life, you're, you're um, you know, you know, if, if you do make room to do what you love in your life, there's no guarantee that you'll succeed. But if you don't do that, what is guaranteed is that you won't be doing what you love in your life. So, like, where's the choice there? So, if it's uh, something that you think you might want to um, go into business with, if you love it, you just have to do it. You know, that's my outlook. If, if you don't do that, then you're just stuck in some cubicle in a day job that's sapping your energy, keeping you from doing all these things that you could explore that maybe you would love. And uh, I would love to encourage people to really think about that. You know, ev uh, even in a scary time like now with, you know, recession or it's really depression, um, it's an opportunity. There are so many things going on now that don't happen when it's economic high times. And a lot of people lost a lot of money during the dot-com. And a lot of people lost their housing. Um, but um, you know, now consultants are in high demand. Companies don't want to hire um, full-time employees because it's too expensive and it's a commitment. But hiring a consultant for a few weeks or a few months or even a few years is something people will do and you get paid three times the money. So, um, you know, and you can learn a lot doing that. And you can also, you can also say, no, <laughs> I won't work in that cubicle. Um, I'll work with these cool people over here. Um, yeah, so, yeah, there's too much to say there, so I'll leave it at that. <laughs> yeah. Will you give out your off codes to TVs? Oh, yeah. Oh, uh, TV Be Gone is now an open source project. And if you look, excuse me, if you look on cornfieldelectronics.com, there's a Maker Fair tab. And uh, a lot of my open source projects are there, including uh, the firmware for TV Be Gone and the plans and the board layout and everything. So for it's all open source. It's all there. And if you have any questions, there's my email. Feel free to email me. Yeah. How'd you pick your manufacturer in Asia and drive prices down and all that stuff that's pretty mm. tough from a guy in the US? Yeah, that's a good question. Uh, how did I pick my manufacturer in, uh, in China? and deal with pricing and all that. Well, I had um, originally thought I would do it in the US because I didn't think many people would want to buy this thing. And uh, so I thought, well, if I'm making a smaller quantity, it doesn't make sense to go to China. And um, the more I looked into it, however, the more it became apparent that there's no way I could afford to do any amount of these in the US. The quality is not good, and the price is too high. And there are a lot of manufacturers in China that are total black holes, but there's a very small but significant n number of manufacturers in China that treat their people well and um, have safety standards and treat the environment well and pay their people decently. And finding them isn't necessarily easy, but by asking a whole bunch of my contacts through people I used to work with, I came across what turned out to be the largest single manufacturer of TV remote controls in the world. <laughs> And they've turned out to be a huge asset. And the reason that they're really good in all of those aspects, as well as good quality and a decent enough price, not the lowest price, but a decent enough price, because I don't care about maximum profits. Cornfield Electronics is a corporation, but it's not publicly traded. It has one shareholder, me. <laughs> if that shareholder is unhappy, then uh, I know what to do about it. So uh, all I have to do to please that shareholder is to get enough money to live off of and if the thing is, I made TV Be Gone to make life better for people. And if it's at the expense of other people, that is not OK by me. So I actually went to China. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks. So I went to China to check these places out. And in China, so often, uh, people do the right things, as people all over the world do, for the wrong reasons. So the reason that this company, CompuTime, is really good for their employees is because they 
were busted for being incredibly horrible a long time ago, and they were going to lose a lot of customers in the West. So they had to clean up their act. Um, another company I'm using now for some of the other things I have in the pipeline, um, they're really good to their employees, uh, again, for the wrong reasons. Uh, they're in Shanghai, and in Shanghai there are so many contract manufacturers uh, that they all try to compete with each other for rock bottom prices, which mean they're treating their employees really horribly. But there's so many of employees quit here and go there. So this place that I'm working with um, distinguishes itself by being high quality. Not the lowest price, but good enough price. So they have to train their employees very well to keep the quality high. Once they're trained, they don't want them to just quit with their, all their training and go to some other place. So they have to pay them well. They have to treat them well. And when I was there checking them out um, last spring, um, I got to know a bunch of the people. My uh, Mandarin is way minimal, uh, and I've forgotten it all since then. But at least I could like, say, hi, what's happening? Um, and I could also talk to the chef and tell him uh, uh, I'm vegetarian. That didn't really work. But if I said I'm Buddhist, that worked. <laughs> And, um, and he made me the most incredible food, and he caters to every one of the employees there, even though this is a huge place. Um, yeah, so anyways, um, that's the story on me picking contract manufacturer. Um, Etonet. <laughs> yeah, if anyone's interested, I can connect you uh, with places I think are, are cool and help you avoid ones that I think are uh, uh, nasty. Same goes with... Uh, Every step along the, uh, the chain from idea through um, manufacturer, through shipping, through fulfillment. Fulfillment was one of the biggest incredible headaches of running TV Be Gone. I started off doing it myself, then hired a place when that was like way stressful because it was 1,200 TV Gones a day coming out of my friend's garage. And we somehow did it, but uh, hiring a place made it way easier. But they made mistakes, and then they had to convince them that it was their mistake and not mine. I hired another one closer to home, but then they would yell at me whenever I pointed out a mistake. And they're still billing me for $2,000 worth of TV Be Gones that they lost <laughs> uh, two years ago. Um, but now, my friend Tom uh, started a fulfillment company in New Jersey, and I use him. And it's perfect. Um, so one of the big rules, big rules for doing business is, and this is my only rule of doing business, don't do business with people you don't like. No matter how much money might be made, it's not worth it. Uh, the guy who used to be my customer in the UK, I violated my own rule. So learn, live and learn. <coughs> so, uh, yeah. You said that when you're in China visiting with these manufacturers to check them out, given how much Chinese you spoke or didn't speak, how were you able during your tours and visits within the company to make the determinations that what you saw convinced you that uh, this was a good place to do business with? Right. Well, is, is that, the question is, uh, how could I tell really uh, given that I don't speak much Chinese, that uh, when I went to a contract manufacturer in China, whether they were really treating their people well and whether it really was a cool place. Well, you know, you can tell. Um, so I'm just small potatoes. A, a plant of 10,000 employees isn't going to put on a dog and pony show for me. So they can't have all these 10,000 people acting happy and have them all pull it off. So they're just going about their day-to-day -day job. The people who interface with me are fluent in English. So I could ask them all of these questions that make them uncomfortable, but they'll answer them anyways. And, um, and then I could talk to individuals. You know, like, it's assembly line work. It's not people jumping up and down for joy uh, because it's the greatest work ever. But uh, these places, the two places that I'm doing work with, people have three-month contracts. So, and um, they come from, this is like some horrible place in China called Shenzhen, a special ep economic zone. Nothing existed there before, but they put these plants up, and people come from all over China, have a three-month contract. They make enough money in that three months to live the rest of the year. Now, I figured out how to do that here, but you know, not too many people in the US can really do that. And, you know, and, and they're, like I said, they're not jumping up and down for joy, but they don't look miserable. The lighting is good. The safety standards are adhered to and uh, enforced. And um, if you talk to someone, they're not like, uh, 
is the boss going to see me? Uh, you know, they're human. They're not, uh, there's no invisible whips anywhere. And, you know, it's very easy to pick up on this. And when I go to another place where the lighting's bad, the tables are too low, people's backs hurt, um, they're afraid of their managers, it's really easy to pick up on this kind of stuff. So when people are content or when people are happy or when people are miserable, so, you know, just use your judgment. Okay, we should probably wind things down. I know Mitch is going to be here for a little while. If you've got questions, you can ask him. Um, I'll keep this mercifully short. Let's thank Mitch again for an inspiring presentation. <laughs> That was awesome. Thank you, Mitch.